everyone. My name is Natalie Gawkner, and this is Both Sides of the Aisle. I am so excited today to have on the political right, Senator Dan McKay. Hey, everybody. And on the political left, Shireen Gorbani. Hello, and hi, listeners. So glad you're with us. Hi, listeners. Hi. So pleasant. June 25th <laughs> is the primary in this state, and boy, are the airwaves filled with political ads. Our mailboxes have a lot of mailers. Let's just break it down. Okay, well, I have a really technical question. Good. Why are, so I do live in a household with a registered Republican. Um, why are all of these flyers showing up after he voted. The ballots are here. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Feels like they're coming in late. What's the like, what's and the going debates. on? I want the, the debates. same thing on the debates. The debates, of course, are this week, but we've had our ballots for a week. Yeah, he voted. Well, I mean, the problem, just from a technical standpoint, when you're on the campaign side of things, you do get a, these people have voted and you can eliminate them, but it's a daily updated thing. And it's as the county recognizes they come in. And so maybe the county was delayed and when he got mm-hmm. the ballot, but- like a lot of people vote within the first 72 hours of getting their ballot. Yeah. Shireen, will you tell the one registered Republican in your household that you always wait till the very end in case something breaks? <laughs> I always wait. I do. I That's haven't a, voted. I haven't either. Mine is sitting on my desk. I haven't voted. Why would you vote before the debates? That's an argument to not even have the debate. It's, a, it's a great question. I'll tell you, he knew exactly what he was doing. Mm. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is a yeah. strategic, this uh, is a Democrat voting strategically in the Republican never. primary. Never. That yeah. never happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start from the top and I'm going to define that. Should I define that as the governor or the Senate race, you guys? Oh. Which one do I want to do first? The Senate is always on the top of the ballot, believe it or not. Okay. Yeah. Well, the good, leave it to Dan to know that. So the Senate race, uh, I watched the debate. Wow. It was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, of course, this is John Curtis. I won't get all the first names right, but Mayor Staggs. Bill Walton. Speaker Wilson, yeah. Bill Walton. Uh, it it struck me as Curtis stood out as different than the other three. Yeah, I agree with that. I So I wasn't able to watch the whole thing, but caught some clips today. I agree with that. I, I also have to say, I've been really surprised and noticed some reporting in the trip that Basically, Wilson's campaign has kind of stopped. Fizzled a little bit. Stopped buying ads and those sorts of things. Yeah. And to me, he kind of disappeared a little on the debate stage, too. There were some moments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, But I don't know. It was an interesting it was an interesting showing. What are some of the things that you would say, Natalie, stood out for you as differentiators or what stood out to you about what Curtis was doing? Well, so Staggs was definitely claiming the MAGA vote. No surprise there. He got President Trump's endorsement. Curtis was being the very um, deliberate, wise, seasoned, uh, I'm a conservative that takes on China. He had all these, you know, right, um, I think, uh, powerful statements about how he positions himself. It's Jason Walton, by the way. Okay. Not Bill Walton. That's the basketball player. That's the basketball player. Yeah, thank you. Thank no, you. Who recently I did, died. That's my fault. Yes. That's... But Dan, the, the representative Curtis or John Curtis, he... Um, made it clear that seniority carries over from the House to the Senate. I'd yeah. forgotten that. And that, that's actually a neat reason to support him. If, if you're kind of 50-50 between two candidates, get the senior one. Get the senior, right. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Did you watch the debate, Dan? I did. I watched oh. the debate. Uh, I thought, actually, I thought all the candidates did really well. They were good. They were yeah. They were attractive. They were articulate, I love knowledgeable. That, I love that we have four, you know, reasonably qualified you know, very competent, intelligent candidates. And you that, thought this Walton candidate problem. was... I thought Jan, I thought Jason Walton did better than I... Because in convention, I'd listened to him a little uh-huh. bit. And I, I wasn't as big a fan at the time. Yeah, yeah. But I thought on the debate stage, I thought he did really well. Yeah. And he thought he, I thought he looked really professional. Shereen, he was polished. Yeah. He was polished. But I will say that he struck me as one of these people that ha- doesn't have a clue how government works. Mile wide, inch deep. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm not, if if this, if Mr. Walton's listening, I'm just suggesting that once you get into government, you start to realize that it's a lot more complicated than you think. And these sort of simple, you know, little axioms of I'll do this, I'll do that. It's bit trickier. Yeah, it always, it's, it's always more nuanced. Yeah. So Dan, as you watched all of it, I'm just wondering, what are some of the key themes that start out to you? Well, it was clear that everybody else was attacking John Curtis, Mm -hmm. you know, or at least trying to, you know, say that John Curtis isn't the guy and that seniority shouldn't matter. And, and they were taking swipes at him that way. And then, you know, I thought the, the, the things that, you know, kind of stood out to me was, you know, President Trump's uh, endorsement of Trent Staggs, I thought, was a big deal. Uh, I thought, believe it or not, I thought you guys thought that Brad Wilson disappeared a little bit. 
I will say that Brad was in his element. Um, and when you see him on a stage with four people who are very qualified, he is also very qualified. Mm-hmm. Very and strong. He's, he's more mile deep. Yeah, he's more he, mild. He could deep. speak to water yep. in depth. Yep. You know, he knows his stuff. Um, I didn't think he disappeared as much as it's just that is a hard stage to be on because you've got someone who's totally MAGA oriented. Yeah. And how do you deal with that? And yeah. then you got such a reasonable person as as John Curtis who's taking all the heat. But you yeah. see, you'd see why. I mean, rumor or whatever it is, you can see why Wilson did not want John Curtis in this race. Oh yeah. Right. Because if, if Wilson or sorry, if, if Curtis wasn't taking that road, Mm -hmm. would that be Wilson? I think that's what Wilson is left to ask himself is, yeah. Would that be me? I told uh, John Curtis's chief of staff when I saw him recently, I said, you know, if you hadn't have gotten in, then we would possibly have two moderates, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a a Senator and a, and a representative. And I would have liked that. Yeah. But uh, it's going to be interesting. Now, at the end of that debate, there was a zinger. Okay. And I'm trying to go out and ride my bike, and I'm trying to get out of the house, but I, I'm trying to listen to closing statements. And Staggs got, through flip of a coin, got to have the last word. You know this, Dan, yeah. from watching it. And he threw out an allegation that John Curtis was engaged in insider trading, a felony, apparently. Yeah. And it was pretty strategic because he's the last one to speak, and supposedly you don't get a speak again. Right. But John Curtis weighed right in. And our producers given me the quote, just to remind you, that is such a low shot, Curtis said. You wait till I have no response. You throw something out I can't respond to. You accuse me of a felony here tonight. You better have very good evidence. Yeah. Whoa. That's a lot of fireworks going right at the end of the debate. Okay. But let's just, let's just ask the inconvenient question in this whole thing, right? How are people going to Congress, you know, a one millionaire or two millionaire and leaving Congress this multi-bajillionaire, right? Whatever that number is, I don't know. Wow. And it is both sides and something's up. And and I'm not saying (laughs) Staggs is right about Curtis because I don't have the details, but something's up in D.C., where folks are walking away with a lot more money than they than they walked in with. How do you spell Menendez? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not to be too, uh, not to make it personal, but like also Chris Stewart, our former representative, who turned from a pretty, I mean, whatever, comfortable, modest background, is now a consultant in like DC. This is absolutely the name of the game, right? People yeah. are looking for ways to further enrich themselves. And I think we suffer for it. Mm. And there's a, just everyone will laugh. I, uh, I don't know if they'll laugh. But there is a Twitter account that follows congressional filings on stock trades, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I can just tell you, I just thought, hey, this would be interesting. I'm going to put some money in and follow their positions on these deals. Mm -hmm. And since the beginning of the year. You're doing all right? 4X. Okay. Okay. It, we we also so got. I get the I get yeah, the zinger. Yeah, this See? is interesting. I go hope ahead. our listeners find this interesting. Okay, so let's go to the governor's race. And uh, I've been traveling a lot uh, in state. You know, I've been down in Green River. I've been up up north. I've you know been up down south. But you know, Representative Lyman, his signs are everywhere. I've never seen a rural candidate for governor be so uh, marketed in yeah. the state. I was yeah. up in Cottonwood Heights this weekend and seeing a lot of his signs. So Dan, from the, what's up with this? He, he's, he's putting up a legitimate campaign. I was going to say, I will say that I think, I think that Representative Lyman has done the best of coming from convention and being a convention winner to putting that into a credible statewide campaign than anyone has done yeah. in recent memory. He's on KSL Radio Drive Time, Shereen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, I was down in southern Utah and saw the signs as well. Though I have to say, I did drive through one town, not recalling which one it was, that was clearly a Cox town. <laughs> like, it had mm-hmm. some Cox signs out. Uh-huh. But truly, for every small town that I drove through between lots here Lyman. and Torrey, lots of Lyman. What do you but make? it doesn't matter because it's not converting matter. to the polls. What nope. do you make of this investigation <laughs> involving CITLA, where they found uh, Representative Lyman to be unprofessional, but no illegal conduct it it struck me as unfortunate that that's that type of information is coming out just weeks before a, a primary vote uh, you know that just feels wrong to me um does it feel wrong to you because it feels out of step with things that we know that Lyman has done I mean I would say look to things I don't like he's the timing of it I, I would have said yeah. you got to have stuff like that out by May 1 sure or after the primary it just it 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 smells. Yeah, I can understand that criticism. I will just also say there there's a record of behavior, previous behavior around Lyman that might suggest 
that this m- might not be entirely out of character. I I think the timing thing is tough, but he's he's wild. I don't know. I yeah. don't know what to tell well, you, uh, Dan. But he... if the Tribune, if the Tribune, I to Natalie's point, I think it is for the Tribune to take a swipe that low, mm-hmm. right? About this like thing. I just thought it was just weird time. I'm with you, yeah. Natalie. Well, I this think some of... people are just sort of like I'm just going to ignore that. Yeah, it plus, would have meant more if it was in April. Plus, sure. if you if you look at if you look at rural Utah and the lands issues and all this stuff, yeah. there is He's no a, question. There is some very personal feelings about how the federal oh, government yeah. is managing Utah. I lands. will say, Dan, though, you and I joke about you know Natalie's never been an elected official, but she's advised some, and I would advise Representative Lyman on a public policy issue to never use the term gang rape. Mm-hmm. I just don't think that's a good term. Yeah. I don't think it's a great term when there are a lot of women in the room. Yeah. You know. Just yeah. don't talk like that. The conduct yeah. is not good. Don't talk like that. But poll uh, shows Cox uh, far ahead. Yeah. And I think we'll know. Um, well, I know we'll know, but I my prediction is that we'll see, a, you know, a double digit lead for Cox for coming Cox. out of the primary. You well, agree, both which, of you? Which has been interesting because the critics of Cox in the past were saying, you know, in the last primary, he didn't get a plurality of the vote over 50 percent. So... There were there were some of that. I don't think you know based on polling today. I don't see that being the case this time. Yeah. Do you have a guess? What is he coming at? Oh, point at me. I'm I'm going to say he's close to sixty percent. Okay. Well, I was double digits. So yeah. yeah. How about you? I'm going to go with seventy seven. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> hey, Whoa. we've got lots more news to talk about. Stick with us. Uh, Natalie Gochner with Shereen Gorbani and Dan McKay. You're listening to Both Sides of the Aisle on Utah Public Radio. We love to hear from listeners like you. If you would like to send us a comment, email bsotapodcast at gmail.com. That's bsotapodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Shireen Gorbani on the left. Dan McKay on the right. Natalie Gawker in the political center, and this is both sides of the aisle. We've covered some of the big uh, headliner um, races, but let's talk about CD2 for a minute. This is Celeste Malloy, Colby Jenkins. Anyone watch the debates? Anything to say there? I, I don't vote chance. in that district. Me neither, so I didn't watch them. Yeah. Yeah. How- so I just caught, a, again, just some highlights, some clips. I would just say I think there is... Um, there's there's a lot to be said, I think, about how quickly when you're in these roles, how much more, you know, and understand. Mm-hmm. Right. So I would just say Representative Malloy certainly represented herself well. Um, yeah. I don't know. A lot of upside to her for sure. Yeah. And I, I don't <laughs> I mean, not for me, but in general, I thought, yeah, a, a good performance. OK. And, and, you know, again, I don't know her, but smart, mm-hmm. worked in the office, um, runs a pretty, you know, uh, professional campaign. Well, and she's one of the first I've ever seen go from staff to an elected office. To elected, like it's just rare that someone's staff makes that crossover. Yeah. And even she said before that it's hard for her to think of herself as congressperson. She thinks of herself frequently as staff. Yeah. You know, so. And her her opposition, this Colby Jenkins. I mean, I, I don't know him, so yeah. I, I don't have a lot to offer for the and listeners. I don't, I don't think that we can say that there's any uh, good evidence to support that. Um, necessarily having a woman means a more progressive view or anything like that. But I do think it is important just at the baseline from a visual representation, should she come through, she is likely to be our only Mm -hmm. female representative in Congress. And I think that just even from an optic standpoint is important. Not bad. Yeah. Um, but doesn't always align with policies that are good for women. But uh, it, yeah. CD1, important. Republican side, we have Blake Moore and Paul Miller. Am yeah. getting that right? Um, Blake is someone I know well. Um, I found it interesting that in the coverage that this Paul Miller is talking a lot, positioning himself as a, as a member of the middle class. Yeah. And in, in settings I'm in, people are talking more and more about the middle class. And mm. they must... In the, in a politician's case, they must know that that's resonating. Yeah, I was going to say, I well, I don't know if he's doing that on purpose or if that's like he's it, it's his thing and he's leaning into it. And he's you never know at the end of a campaign what resonates with people. Um, but those two were the only two in convention, yeah. and believe it or not, like you know, he with that message really resonated with delegates. Yeah, there was a quote in the debate where uh, Paul Miller said, "There's one thing that I have that Blake doesn't have." And that is that I'm middle class. 
He's mm. poking fun at him that Blake has a little bit of money. Yeah. Well, if he goes to Congress, then he probably will <laughs> quickly money. as well. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I've yeah. always thought the great secret of America is that everybody thinks they're middle class. Oh. We oh, have a large middle class, yeah. and most people, you know, identify as part there. of the middle class. Yeah. So it's it's a big group. Yeah. Yeah. I think it. I think it guides different. I think people see people in elected office generally because it takes quite a bit of resources or a job that allows you the flexibility to be able to run for something like this. Mm-hmm. As people who are kind of fundamentally out of touch of what it feels like to go to the grocery yeah. store and be like, "Wow, ch- strawberries cost five dollars yeah. a carton now," or milk is whatever, right? Not a milk drinker. Otherwise, I would know what it is. But there is like something I think that is fundamentally connective about wanting to have. You, to be able to cast your vote for somebody who feels more like the every everyday yeah. person. I think if you asked AI, said, you know, generative AI and said, show me what a congressman from Utah looks like. Mm. I, I'm pretty sure AI would just go to Blake Moore and just say, this is what it looks like. Really? I love uh, that. Male, like, tall. Male, tall, you know. But but like every like he just looks like when I look at Blake Moore, that's what a congressperson looks like to me. That's why I don't run. He looks young to looking. me for a congressman. Yeah, I, I would think AI would generate someone a little older. Oh, Blake. Oh, just a thought. Okay. Hey, okay, let's the, do it. The AG's race on the Republican side: uh, Derek okay. Brown, Rachel Terry, uh, Frank Mylar. This is an interesting bunch. Um, I feel like I know Derek Brown quite well. Yeah. Uh, excited about his candidacy. I do not know Rachel Terry, but there's a woman uh, statewide elected office that you could get would another love, one. Yeah, I would love to see that. So here's, again, let, let me just ask, do you feel like these candidates are people, I mean, we already have seen some reporting on Frank Myler that suggests maybe um, just some ethical uh, concerns. Offering um, someone a job in his administration if they drop out of the race. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but do you think in between these other I think candidates? It was after the person was out of the race. Like he was af- he was out of the race and said, hey, would you be willing, you know? Do we feel like this is a pathway, either of these two candidates, to restore the public's trust in the AG's office? I mean, we have had Republican attorney generals in this state year after year after, I guess, term after term, um, with Shereen, real problems. I have bad news. There's going to be another one, <laughs> yeah. another Republican after this you, year. Just, yeah. Do you think that... Um, just a heads up. Just, like, as, <laughs> just as many problems around conduct, behavior, corruption? Well, I think the AG's office is always one that is, uh, it's a tough one, all right? Trying to figure out, you know, how you run for elected office, the people that want to contribute and want to be part of that office and want to, you know, influence the AG might not necessarily be the people you want your AG hanging out with. Mm-hmm. And so that's what breeds like Senator McKell, should we make an appointed, you know, position? Yeah. And the voters, I think, have been pretty clear. No, we 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 want to keep voting for this person. So I I think until we answer some of those fundamental questions, we're always going to have to deal with those conflicts or questions. Yeah. I'll put myself solidly in the camp that I want the governor to nominate a attorney general and have the Senate confirm. Mm. That would be my preferred. But that's after 18 years in a governor's office where I watched the conflicts and mm-hmm. it was just uncomfortable. Yeah, you know when the chief executive has a different opinion than the attorney general on the legal positioning of the state. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. But that happens all the time. Yeah. Well, we had a Democrat. We had Jan Graham. Yeah. And so we didn't have the same party. But then if you go all of the the conflicts that we've seen or, you know, misconduct, misstep, you know, misconduct it's been a long time. And Dan, I know you were thought of as a candidate for the AG's office. What made you not seek it? Dan has a legal background when, for our listeners and is, you know, was talked about as someone to be that. My wife asked me one day, you know, <laughs> one day we were out and she, you know, our minds were on something else to come and ask you, do, would you rather be a legislator or in the AG's office? Which would you rather do right now? Just answer. And it just came back. I'd rather be a legislator. Mm-hmm. And that's why I didn't run. Yeah. Well, you got a big smile on your face today, so it seems <laughs> to be working. Should we go on to other things, you guys? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, of course, caught my attention was that we have our former, um, you know, co-host Dougal back in the news yeah. um, because now there is a hotline where Utahns can report uh, violations uh, basically of, I guess, diversity, equity and inclusion programs that they feel are violating the intent of the state law to um, outlaw them. Um, yeah. I guess I would just say this all feels incredibly uh Again, like we, I talk frequently about government overreach, but kind of just thinking about the ways in which we have now, like snitch lines for people, uh, feels just. But yet, it was like, okay during COVID, right? Just feels dystopian to me. Um, 
Yeah, I think diversity, equity, and inclusion isn't going to kill anyone. Um, and there were lots of lessons we learned in COVID. Um, but yeah, I think that this is really uh, just a, a marker of kind of where we're headed with yeah. some sure. strains of the Republican Party in the state. One thing I would say, and I'm not commenting on the snitch factor, but I have seen John in the news so much, whether it was for the bathroom bill yeah. or for this DEI line. Yeah. It helps him in CD3, where he's got, you know, Senator Kennedy, who's a strong candidate, J.R. Byrd, Stuart Pay. I met Stuart Pay for the first time last week. He's impressive. Stuart is a good man. I do not know Case Lawrence. But uh, anyway, yeah, I don't know about the snitch line, but I think it's helping Dougal that he's in the news. (laughs) Yeah. and, And, you know, from the DEI violations, bathroom violations, like there has to be some mechanism. Remember, These are reporting of government entities to another government entity. It's not necessarily reporting, you know, on citizens, so to speak. It is a reporting of a government entity, which is appropriate by the auditor's office, even if John doesn't want to be the bathroom monitor. Okay, but that is not what's necessarily happening with the bathroom reporting, just to be clear. It's not a government agency reporting. It's people calling in. And some of those have been a, a small, small fraction, but some of them have been considered uh, investigatable, I guess. And I just like really want listeners to ask themselves, do they want to live in a society where somebody perceives that they're walking into the wrong bathroom and yeah. there's a line, that a hotline that you can call this state? I just think that's like not how I want to live. Too much government for me. Yeah, me too. Hey, uh, OK, I just have to bring this up. Tucker Carlson announced a live tour. He's going to appear in Salt Lake City with Glenn Beck. Of course, Glenn Beck, uh, LDS, has some, you know, maybe ties to this state in that way. But This is a time when I don't want to be downtown, Dan. This is September 7th. Um, This is a, you know, this is a, what, a a group of of, um, discussions that are in the Marjorie Taylor Greene kind of world, the Donald Trump Jr. kind of world. It's going to be an interesting time downtown. Yeah. Did you get your tickets, Dan? Uh, Actually, I'll be appearing on stage as well, you know, just for kicks and giggles. (laughs) I mean, look what, look at Tucker Carlson commoditizing um, populism in this way, where he can actually be fired, wasn't he, from Fox? Yeah. He's let yeah. go. Yeah. And then go do his own thing. Yeah, and and be madly successful and make a lot more money, which is crazy about the whole That's media crazy. of today, right? It's not necessarily on a channel anymore. It's a social media. My platform. husband complains about people like Tucker Carlson. He's not a Donald Trump fan. And I always remind him, it's not them. It's the American public. Yeah. yeah. Like these people have support of our fellow patriots. That's right. There's hundreds of millions of people who are tuning in to listen to what they have to say. Yeah. And, the, and, and that, care. for good or bad. And the care. And care. And so when I say not a good time to be downtown, I, I want to be careful about that. I mean, go downtown. It's always good to be downtown. Yeah, mingle okay. and whatever. But <laughs> but it's not your normal downtown crowd. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of downtown, um, we are seeing advanced uh, conversations around what's happening with the, are we calling it arts entertainment convention and something district? <laughs> it will be everything it by will the time be it's everything. all done. But will it be a benefit to the residents of Salt Lake City? What do we think? Shireen, so you're so, (laughs) she didn't tell me she was going to ask this, Dan, but (laughs) let me just give you a number. Somewhere between 20 and 25% of the sales tax paid for this Mm -hmm. will be from Salt Lake City residents Mm -hmm. directly. Yeah. The rest is from outside the city and business. That's a benefit to the city. That's a benefit to the city. That's a benefit. Um, what I mean is that the city doesn't bear this on their shoulders. They benefit tremendously from having a vital downtown core. They only have to pay one in every four dollars for it. And and to the speaker and presidents, you know, and I can say this to everybody. I think it's very public. Ryan Smith has been very public with it as well. They said under no circumstances are we going to leave the jazz or have a scenario where the jazz leave downtown. And have those blocks empty with an empty arena or arena that is underperforming and all of the issues that might come as a result. Right. And and so I just look at those alternative and I'm like, well, I think if you had that alternative, I'll choose the more vibrant. Sure. I guess I'll just say that I think when um, leaders have a vision for a downtown for a revitalization that may or may not rest on giving a large amount of our tax dollars to people who are already billionaires. I feel like this is the anti-billionaire <laughs> yeah. um, episode this but, week. But, but, but when we think about like you could have a vision for that, you could plan for that, you could tax for that. Mm-hmm. This is a unique opportunity, and I do think in some ways, honestly, right, the legislature put 
the city, again, in a bit of a, in between a rock and a hard place to have to negotiate this quickly. And therefore, I think we're not going to get the best deal that we could get. But I do appreciate that I've, at least the city's trying to create a, a more inclusive and, and bigger kind of a view on how this will ultimately benefit the citizens here. I don't think that the alternative is just an empty lot we with have, a tumbleweed going We have through. to be out of time, but I'll <laughs> just seconds. say the city does not share that opinion, by the way. Like, they feel empowered and they feel grateful for the opportunity because, honestly, if you contrast that with creating the legislature, creating a statewide authority to do all of this yeah. for them— yeah. This or the inland port. Better. The this... inland port would be a great example. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And I guess I'll just say I get the last word here, but um, you get one chance to do this. Don't miss it, city. Don't miss it, Salt Lake City. Yeah, don't blink. This is important. Hey, thanks everybody for listening. Natalie Gochner with Shreen Gorbani, Dan McKay. Programs produced by Anthony Skoma. Thank you for listening. <laughs>